Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. Thank you again for the blessing of your word. We thank you for the privilege of being gathered together as your people. Lord, as your word is proclaimed now, we pray that you would bless it. Lord, do it only you can to open up our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds. Lord, may we receive it for what it is, the word of God, not the word of man. Pray, Lord, that you would get me out of the way and so that your people would simply receive your word. Lord, I pray that you would guard and protect what is said and what is remembered and understood. May it be only your truth and nothing else. Father, we pray now that you would bless the preaching of your word. Uh, may it be blessed unto the conversion of sinners and the edification of your people. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we are beginning a new series in the book of Jonah. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, our regular practice as a church is to simply work through books of the Bible, uh, teaching verse by verse, uh, believing this is the best way for us to proclaim the whole counsel of God, which uh, we are accountable to do. Um, and so we are beginning a new series here looking in Jonah. And Jonah is a fascinating book and is actually quite unique uh, among what are referred to as the minor prophets. Uh, while the other minor prophets, other uh, shorter books uh, named after prophets, uh, they will usually contain oracles, uh, messages from the prophets themselves, right? Something that a, that a prophet would declare to the people. Uh, Jonah is different in that it tells a story about Jonah, right? We, we have a narrative here, a story of what happened to him, uh, rather than just a, a teaching of what he proclaimed to a particular people, which is what you have with most of the rest of the minor prophets. Now, it's possible that this may have been written by Jonah himself later in life, uh, but the text is silent regarding the identity of the author, so we don't know for certain. Uh, but the author does always refer to Jonah in the third person, right? Jonah's, uh, the author is never saying, I did this, I went there. It is always, then Jonah went. Um, if, if it were written by Jonah himself, this would be a good sign uh, that he had truly repented and humbled himself later in life, as it doesn't paint a very flattering portrait of Jonah and the decisions he makes. Now, before we begin to look at the text, I do want to give a quick defense of the historicity of Jonah. Uh, it is suggested by some that the story of Jonah is not actually a true story, but was simply just a parable. I right? think of Jesus telling parables, examples of people who went and did things which would give a moral lesson. Now, among the reasons for this are the arguments that it would actually be impossible for a man to survive in the belly of a great fish or a whale for three days and three nights. Or that it would be impossible for a storm to suddenly arise uh, right at the right moment when it did, or for a plant to grow up uh, fast enough that it would provide shade <laughs> in one afternoon. And I believe that these objections are really just objections to the category of miracles. All right, if your starting point is materialistic naturalism, right, the belief that miracles cannot happen, uh, that there is no God, that everything must have a natural material explanation, then yes, the book of Jonah will be problematic for you. Fact is, your starting point, your method, and your conclusion will always be involved in one another. And so if we remember that the true starting point of all things is that in the beginning, God, God created the heavens and the earth. If our starting point is the triune God of scripture, the one who spoke the universe into existence, ex nihilo, out of nothing, then we see that the problem of explaining how a man could survive inside a fish is really no problem at all. This is the God who calls out the stars by name, who buckled the belt of Orion, who laid the foundation of the earth, who shut in the sea with doors and commands the lightning where to strike. This is the God who turned water to blood, brought down hail and fire, brought darkness upon Egypt, caused a wall of water to stand up on either side so that his people could pass on through the Red Sea. This is the God who preserved his servants. 
in the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar closed the mouths of King Darius's lions. This is the God who through his prophets rained down fire from heaven, then entered into his own creation as a child, kept the law perfectly, died for sins, and returned to heaven. How can we explain a prophet being preserved alive in a fish, in a storm rising up suddenly, or a plant growing in a day? We answer with the Lord's reply to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Again, it is true that from a naturalistic, uh, materialistic point of view, these events are impossible. And that is why we call them miracles. If you take the book of Jonah on its own terms, you'd see that it never actually claims that any of these events happened, quote-unquote, on their own. Read through Jonah, we'll see. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. The Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah. And God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. If you read through Jonah, you'll see that God is a, if not the, primary character. He is the author of these events. He is the one working in and through and over them. And so if men reject the claims made in Jonah, it is simply because they also reject the sovereign predestinating God who is working through these events. And so many people will reject the historicity of Jonah for the same reason that men rejected Jesus. Though the light shines in the darkness, people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. John 3, 19. Accepting the truthfulness of these events forces you to reckon with the reality that there is a God above, that he is active, that he is working, that he is displeased by the evil that he observes on the earth. Regarding Jonah as a parable, there are a number of additional reasons to reject that perspective. Firstly, you'll notice that the book of Jonah identifies Jonah as the same prophet who appears in 2 Kings 14.25. Compare these two texts. Jonah 1.1 1, 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. 2 Kings 14.25 a historical record. God restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. We see Jonah is a character who is rooted in history. His father and his hometown are named. And so we see that he is not just a man, as you might expect in a parable, right? A man went and did such and such. Rather, we have Jonah, son of Amittai, from Gath Hefer. Which, interestingly, and perhaps not coincidentally, is in Galilee. If we read 2 Kings, we see that it also identifies the time that Jonah, son of Amittai, lived and prophesied. Jonah's prophecy was fulfilled in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. And this was in the beginning of the reign of the wicked king, Jeroboam II of Israel. Now, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see this is often how time is recorded. Uh, it will give reference to the reign of the kings of Israel and Judah. As you may remember, Israel and Judah were divided uh, as uh, Israel uh, rebelled against the house of David uh, in punishment for Solomon's sin and Rehoboam's sin. And so each had their own kings. And so you'll read through 
you know, first and second Kings and Chronicles, uh, and it'll often d- describe time this way, right? In the sixth year of this king uh, of Judah and the eighth year of this king of Israel, right? That's when this happened, right? The reign of the kings is their, their way of uh, giving a time reference. And interestingly, I realize this is actually how we still record time. Now, secularists can call it common era and before common era if they want to, but I find it humorous that they can't escape the fact that to this day, we still count our years in relation to the coming of our king. So we keep track of time here now in the 2024th year of our Lord. Anyway, we see for Jonah, his name, his father, his hometown, and his time in history are all identified in the scriptures. You see, these are not the marks of a character who is simply a fictional character in a parable. Right? All of these details root him firmly in history. Furthermore, Jesus himself references Jonah. Uh, interestingly, actually, Jesus, pardon me, Jonah is the only prophet to whom Jesus compares himself directly. And as Jesus refers to the story of Jonah, he does so as something which really happened, which is going to be paralleled in the life of Christ. And we'll unpack that comparison when we get further in Jonah. So all of this to say, there is no compelling reason to read Jonah as anything other than a true account of actual events which really took place in history. And that is how we will be approaching it through this series. So with that introduction, you can turn with me in your Bibles to the text, Jonah 1, verses 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, Uh, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Notice it says, Nineveh's evil had risen up before the Lord. Now Nineveh uh, would eventually become the capital city of Assyria, the Syrian Empire, So to any Israelite readers of Jonah, a statement about the evil of Nineveh would not come as a surprise. Assyria was known for its military might and also for its use of brutality. Commentator uh, Daniel C. Timmer writes that the empire's force and tactics were guided by a royal ideology that laid upon the king the obligation to subjugate the entire world on behalf of their national god, Assur, who was at the summit of the Assyrian pantheon and so laid claim to worldwide rule, close quote. Now, the inscription on the throne of Shalm- Shalmaneser III, king of Assyria, read this. He said, the legitimate king, the king of the world, the king without rival, the great dragon, The only power within the four rims of the earth, overlord of all the princes, who has smashed all his enemies as if they be earthenware, the strong man unsparing, who shows no mercy in battle. Assyria as well is considered today to have been a pioneer in psychological warfare, using their brutality to terrify and demoralize their enemies. Surviving inscriptions from Assyrian kings brag of the brutalities that they performed on their conquered enemies. One such inscription boasts of a king who would flay his prisoners. That is, he would skin them alive. Then he would stretch their skins over the walls of the city. Others brag of of, uh, erecting pillars out of the skulls of the vanquished. And so Assyria would record these atrocities on stone inscriptions 
apparently intending for the word to get out to their enemies. Right? Psychological warfare. <laughs> kind of thing that would cause the courage to melt away in the hearts of the enemy. Can you imagine guarding the walls of the next city after hearing of or even seeing human skins stretched on the walls of Assyria's last conquest? Right, you can see the smoke rising in the distance. You've maybe heard of or seen yourself what they've done to the soldiers who are guarding that city. Now, as Assyria begins marching on your city, coming to you, how courageous are you feeling right now? We see the Assyrians, they were a wicked people. Pagans, I think we can fairly say, who were worshipping bloodthirsty demon gods. Torturing, brutalizing the image of God, human beings, all in the name of their false gods. So Jonah 1 verse 2 says, their evil had come up before the Lord. Their evil had come up before the Lord. Now, I think on one level, this ought to be comforting to hear. Right? As we see evil in the world, as we see wickedness and cruelty and barbarism, we can be left wondering, is there no justice? Does God not see? Does God not know? Does God not care? Here we are told directly, God does see the iniquity of the wicked. Though he is long-suffering, though he is patient, he will not endure the wicked forever. All the wicked are storing up wrath for themselves. Judgment is coming, either in this life or the life to come. But we see God is a God who judges wicked nations. He brings calamity upon them. He destroys them with pestilence, with the sword, with famine and drought. God here tells Jonah to go and to call out against Nineveh. And we'll see in chapter 3, the message he was supposed to deliver was that in 40 days, Nineveh would be overthrown, conquered, destroyed. Jonah was called to deliver this oracle of judgment, right, this declaration of impending doom upon this wicked city and nation. Now it's interesting, we are told in our day uh, that we should never use warnings. Right? We should not preach to wicked nations. We should not warn them of judgment for breaking God's law. And one of the arguments still sometimes here is that God has not entered into covenant with the other nations, right? any nations other than Israel. Therefore, the nations are not obligated to obey God's word, and so we shouldn't try to hold them accountable for it. Interesting, though, if you read scripture yourself, think of Leviticus 18 and 20, you'll see that God says of, that the nations of Canaan were judged for their wickedness. God warns about idolatry, child sacrifice, sexual perversions of all sorts. And he says to his people, he says, Do not make yourself unclean by any of these practices, for by all of these the nations that I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Israel's conquest of Canaan is presented in Scripture as God's judgment upon the wicked. And God warns them, do not do as they did. But we ask, what covenant did God ever enter into with the Canaanites, with the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites? Come to Jonah. Were the Assyrians ever called God's chosen people? Did they ever commit and covenant with him, committing to follow his ways and obey his law? No. And yet, all the same, 
their evil came up before the Lord so that he was preparing to destroy them in judgment. You see, scripturally speaking, it is not only those nations who are in a special covenant relationship with God who would need to fear his judgment. So, Canada must be called to repentance. God is not blind to our evil. Do we not celebrate many of the very things that God lists in Leviticus 18? Has Altona not hosted events celebrating sodomy, celebrating cross-dressing and effeminacy, celebrating all manner of sexual perversion? Is the slaughter of the unborn not regarded as a moral good in this nation, which we call a woman's right to choose? Do we think God is blind to these evils? Do we think modern nations are immune to the judgments of God? The kinds of things God brought upon the Canaanites? Do we think we could do all of the same things as them and yet live in peace indefinitely? God has been abundantly patient. But if calamity does come, we must know that as a nation, we deserve it. This nation has blood on its hands. So the people of God, Christians, we must be a prophetic voice to the nations. We must call them to repentance. We must warn, for we know that all these evils have undoubtedly come up before God. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. We see Jonah attempts to flee. He intends to go to Tarshish, which is apparently away from the presence of the Lord, or so he thinks. Now, commentator Daniel Timmer argues that this is actually meant to be a humorous mocking of Jonah's intentions. As the rest of this book demonstrates, you cannot escape the presence of God by traveling on a boat. You know, as Jonah prays in chapter 2, uh, the language he uses demonstrates that he was familiar with the Psalms. I think perhaps some meditation on Psalm 139 may have done Jonah some good. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be as night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. See, God is every bit as present in Tarshish as he is in Israel. As Jonah would learn, God is even with him in the depths of the sea. Now, this reality should do two things. We should be warned and we should be comforted. The warning is that there is nowhere you can go to escape from the presence of God. He is there. He knows what you're doing. He sees. You cannot hide anything from the judge of the earth. No matter where you go, you cannot escape his presence or his claims on your life. Right? You could leave your church. You could leave your hometown and move to New Zealand. But you will not escape the presence of the Lord. 
he is there even as he is here. All right, we live our whole lives, coram Deo, before the face of God. It is folly to think that we could flee from his presence, that we could hide anything from him. He sees, he knows, he is there. And for the people of God, we ought to also be comforted by this. And as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as you encounter the dark night of the soul, times as you suffer and feel alone, remember this, you are not alone. The Lord God is with you. He is ever present. He has promised he will not leave you nor forsake you. Though you may not feel his nearness in the same way, he is every bit as present in the dark valley as at the mountaintop. Let this be comforting to you. You are never alone. Christians, you always have a companion. You always have someone to turn to. Be comforted. So Jonah went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. We see Jonah did not like the instructions he had received from God. Uh, he did not want to go to Nineveh and perform his duty as God's prophet. And so he seeks to flee. Right? He tries to run away. Uh, Tarshish is thought to have been in modern-day Spain, uh, which is basically the exact opposite direction uh, from where Jonah was supposed to be going. So now the big question that confronts us here is why? Why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Well, one common answer you may have heard, one that would be understandable given what we've seen of the Assyrians, is that Jonah was scared. He was frightened. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew of their brutality and was scared for his life. That would be reasonable. That would make sense. I could understand that. I could relate to that. Hey, pastor, why don't you go preach to the Assyrians? Yeah, just follow the, the pillars of human skulls. <laughs> you can't miss it. A bit of fear would only be natural. Interestingly, though, if that is a reason, it's not mentioned by Jonah. Or perhaps Jonah was worried that his preaching would fall on deaf ears, right? that it would be ineffective. Right? Here's this empire, their foreign policy is directed by their bloodthirsty God demanding total conquest, and they appear to be doing fairly well in that regard. Now in those days, the general worldview was that when peoples would battle, when nations would battle, the nation with the stronger gods would be the nation who would win would be victorious. Why would an empire like Assyria care about the words of a prophet claiming to represent the god of a tiny nation on Assyria's border? It's reminiscent of Moses and Aaron appearing before Pharaoh. Remember that story? Uh, they go and say, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, demands, let my people go that they may serve me. And Pharaoh responds, who is Yahweh? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Why should Pharaoh care what the God of his slaves has to say? Right, from Pharaoh's perspective at this point, Yahweh can't be much of a God if his people have been enslaved by Egypt for the last 400 years. Likewise, we would understand it if that had maybe been what was in Jonah's mind. Right? Why would the Assyrians listen to me so we might have thought Jonah doesn't want to go because he thinks it would be a fool's errand, a waste of time, thinking they won't listen anyway. That too, while being faithless, would at least be understandable from a human perspective. Tragically, Jonah's actual reason for not wanting to go is even worse yet. Chapter 4, Jonah tells us directly why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. So after Jonah eventually did go, spoiler warning, uh, wonder of wonders, Nineveh does repent. 
at the preaching of Jonah. And so God relented of the disaster he was going to do to them. Jonah 4, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Right? God relenting from the disaster he said he would do displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a God and merciful, slow to anger, a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah's own stated reason for fleeing Nineveh, for fleeing the presence of the Lord, was not fear. It was not even that he was afraid they wouldn't listen and repent. No, the reason Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh is because he was afraid that they would listen. That they would repent. He was afraid his mission would be a success. And he didn't want that. Why? And this does not paint a flattering picture of this prophet. But the reason is, Jonah did not want God to show mercy to Nineveh. Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. So one of the major themes of this book, as we'll see, is the compassion of God. The compassion of God to the Gentiles, to the wicked, to the undeserving, uh, as contrasted by Jonah's lack of compassion. Now, there could be one more additional point which may help understand where Jonah is coming from, although it certainly does not excuse his lack of compassion. And that is, Jonah may have been concerned for Israel. Consider, Assyria uh, is a mighty and brutal empire. Uh, they loom large in the minds of their neighboring free nations. Right? Uh, in my lifetime, there has always been peace between Canada and the United States, which is wonderful when you live that close to such a big nation. Uh, but imagine what it would be like to live here, uh, to live in Gretna, if the United States became our enemies, if they hated us, if their national religion told them that we must be conquered, we must be wiped out. I think people from different parts of the world can relate to what that's like. Having powerful neighbors that hate you and want to see you wiped off the map. It's not the nicest feeling to have an empire like this looming at your doorstep. Particularly one as brutal as the Assyrians. And so if God were to bring judgment on Assyria, that means that Assyria immediately becomes less of a threat to Israel. Right? If their power is smashed, if their city is destroyed, uh, if they got all kinds of internal problems to deal with, well, maybe that gives Israel some breathing room. They don't need to worry. Now, we're not told this directly. It doesn't say this anywhere in Jonah. Uh, but from a, a level of human motivation, this would be plausible. Uh, we might even say, if this were the case, that it would be relatable to a certain extent. But here's where it ought to really hit home for us. Because we see in this book that even if this had been Jonah's motivation, it does not excuse his lack of compassion. Jonah still gets rebuked by God. Here's the lesson. We must have compassion for the lost. We must have compassion toward those who do not know God, even if we see them as a threat to our nation or to our way of life. Now, that's not to say that there is never a time to take up arms against invaders. We see on the personal level, our desire ought to be to see others brought to faith. To see them receive mercy from God. To see their nations conquered, not by the sword, but by the gospel. 
Now, Jonah's lack of compassion gets put on particular uh, display as we see the compassion that God shows to him. Right, he ran away from the Lord. <laughs> he rejected the Lord. He had no compassion for these people. And yet God saved him and even reinstates him as a prophet. Jonah received mercy. Jonah received grace. Those who have re received grace ought to show grace to others. After all, who are we apart from the grace of God? You know, I have the great privilege of a Christian heritage, Christian parents and grandparents and beyond who have passed on the faith. God has been gracious to us. God has been merciful to us. But where would I be right now if God had not shown grace to my ancestors? If he had not shown grace to me? But for the grace of God, for his intervention in my heart, the work of his spirit within me, would I not also be living as a rebel against God? Did we do anything at all in order to merit or earn the grace of God toward us? Did Jonah believe himself or his countrymen more deserving of grace from God than other people or nations? Now, it may be true, maybe not everybody was as brutal as the Assyrians. But the fact is, nobody is deserving of grace from God. You know, people who would be upset with God because of all the evil and wickedness in the world might find it initially comforting to discover that God is a God of justice. But I think that comfort will quickly fade when we come to realize what strict and pure justice would mean for us. You know, it's actually a common argument against God to say that God cannot be good or he cannot be all-powerful because, look, all of this evil, all this wickedness, all this cruelty in the world. The argument goes, an all-powerful God would be able to get rid of all this wickedness and an all-good God would want to. He would want to get rid of all this evil. So we look around and see, well, this world is still pretty broken, still pretty wicked, we conclude then either God must not be all-powerful or he must not be all-good or he does not exist at all. We ask, okay, you skeptic, unbelieving person, do you really want God to wipe out all evil from the face of the earth? The Bible actually records a time when he did that once. We call it Noah's Flood. See, if God simply wiped out all the evil from the earth, would that not include you? What do the scriptures say about your heart? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may not be as outwardly wicked you may not have done, committed atrocities like the Assyrians, but you also have sinned against God. You also fall short of his glory. You have not worshipped and honored him as God as he deserves. You have broken his holy law. Scripture categorizes you as a sinner. You still want God to wipe every evil thing? from the face of the earth. Now, thankfully, the Lord has covenanted with all flesh, saying he will never do that again, as in the days of Noah. So what if we had another option? God is all good. God is all powerful. And God is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. His desire, his purposes, are not simply to destroy his fallen creation, but to redeem it. 
Though you and me and Jonah and the Assyrians all deserve the judgment of God for our sins, God, being rich in mercy, sent his own son into the world. Jesus Christ lived the life that we have failed to live, the life of perfect obedience to God's law. And Jesus died on the cross, taking the wrath of God against the sin of his people, the judgment that we deserved. And Christ has purchased a people from every tribe and tongue, and language and nation. It is not because we are deserving that God has shown us grace. It is rather so that God would be glorified for his mercy. And so as we look out to a world lost in sin, we need to see ourselves in them, recognizing that apart from the grace of God, we would be no different. And knowing that God's sovereign grace can reach and save them, just as it saved us. A Christian can never look down on another image bearer of God. For we know that they will be accepted before God the exact same way we were. If they will repent and come through Christ, they will be accepted. They will be received. They will be forgiven. They will be adopted into the family of God. And so if you have experienced the grace of God, if God has delivered you, if God has forgiven you, if God has given you a second chance, as he did for Jonah, you must be a gracious person. If you have experienced and received grace, you must extend grace. If you have received and known the love of God, you must show love. If you are a follower of Christ, you must have the attitude of Christ who laid down his life for his enemies. You must obey your Lord who commands his people to bless when cursed, to pray when persecuted. You must be merciful and compassionate as God is merciful and compassionate. Jonah, prophet from Galilee, turned and fled in order to avoid seeing his enemies receive mercy. Jesus, the greater prophet from Galilee, did the opposite. Though he had every chance to flee, to turn away, to call angels to come and destroy his persecutors, Jesus set his face toward the cross where he would suffer so that the enemies of God, like you and me, could receive mercy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful mercy. We thank you for your kindness and your grace. Father, we pray that you would cause your people to be gracious, to extend grace as we have received grace. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see the lost uh, as you see them, uh, that we would have a desire to reach those uh, who do not know you. Lord, that we would have a desire for your name to be proclaimed in places that is not. Father, we pray that you would bless this congregation, that you would bless all that is done through the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.